This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 62. Coming up on Space Time, how our solar system was formed, one of the brightest quasars ever seen, and the Large Hadron Collider begins accelerating its first atoms. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have shed new light on how solar systems, including our own, are formed. They've mapped an interstellar molecular gas and dust cloud, providing a three-dimensional map of its structure by watching it sing with magnetic vibrations. The findings, reported in the journal Science and on the pre-press physics website archive.org, shed new light on the mystery of how stars are born and how their planetary systems are formed through the gravitational collapse of molecular gas and dust clouds. Our Sun and Solar System, including the Earth, were formed out of a very similar gas and dust cloud about 4.6 billion years ago. The new study's lead author, Dr Aris Tritzis from the Australian National University, says the research visualised the 3D shape of a star-forming cloud called Musca. Musca looks like a needle in the sky, about 450 light-years away, just south of the Southern Cross. The cloud, which is formed mainly out of molecular hydrogen and dust, stretches about 27 light-years across the plane of the sky, with a depth of about 20 light-years and just a fraction of a light-year wide. The authors were able to reconstruct the three-dimensional structure of the gas cloud using magnetic seismology, based on data from the European Space Agency's Herschel Space Telescope. They found that Musk is in the very early stages of making new stars and planets, a process which will ultimately take millions of years to form. Knowledge of the three-dimensional shape of these clouds will greatly improve science's understanding of these stellar nurseries, as well as the birth of our own solar system. With its three-dimensional shape now determined, Musca can be used as a laboratory for testing star formation, astrochemical and dust formation hypotheses. The new model allows scientists to see this cloud not as a thin static streak of gas in space, but a vibrating, complex structure. Despite its needle-like appearance, Musca actually resembles a sheet being viewed edge-on. Musca is surrounded by ordered hair-like structures called striations, which are produced by trapped waves of gas and dust caused by the global vibrations of the cloud. Tritzis and colleagues were then able to determine the shape of Musca by analysing the spatial frequencies of these vibrations, which were then converted into ringing tones to reveal what the astronomers are now calling the Song of Musca. Tritzis describes it as a cloud in space that's singing. All he had to do was listen. In addition to providing new insights into stellar and planetary formation, the model of the Musca cloud can also be used to see how molecules form in gas clouds. Tritzis says Musca is the largest structure in the Milky Way galaxy known to be vibrating as a whole. And there are a whole range of new things which science can learn from this model. Musca so far is the, is the largest structure in the galaxy that we found to, to vibrate as a whole. And this is, this is really awesome. And... I think that one of the innovative things here was that we didn't actually use new observations. We didn't, took, we didn't take new observations, right? We just improved our theories and were able to, to deduce better, better results from existing observations. That's, in my, in my view, one of the innovative things here. But, you know, of course, the fact, the fact that it vibrates and the first determination of the 3D shape are well above <laughs> what I just said. The fact that it sinks... Um, or in you know more scientific words, the fact that it vibrates as a whole, that that's what makes it special. What's causing the vibration? Uh, the vibrations are caused by the magnetic field. These are waves uh, that we found. We found that um, in Musca there are trapped waves caused by the magnetic field. They are actually magnetic pressure waves. And what's causing the magnetic pressure waves? <laughs> That's a long story. Um, that those kind of waves could be excited either during and from uh, the formation of the cloud, or they can be excited because of other magnetic waves. Things in the vicinity, things surrounding Musca. Yes. Yes, basically. You get some because of the rotation of the galaxy. You might excite some sort of uh, magnetic waves, and those kind of waves will in turn 
excite the magnetic pressure waves that make Mushka vibrate. And this is interesting because it's in the process of collapsing and forming stars and hopefully planets. Right, right. And we haven't, there isn't any pronounced star formation yet in Mushka. If the gravity will, um, will need a lot, of, a lot more time to overcome uh, all the other forces that support the cloud, and be able to, you know, make everything collapse and form stars and, and planets. It's a delicate operation, isn't it? It's not just a question of gravity collapsing things down. It's also got to remain cold enough inside for molecules to survive long enough. Exactly. And actually, molecules are one of the actually serve as coolant. So they absorb the, the temperature, the heat, and they emit it. And that's one of the process how molecular clouds cool. How far away is Moscow from our solar system? From it. It's about 500 light years or 140, 150 parts. And at that distance, how much detail can we see? Uh, actually, Herschel, the space telescope, was able to, to provide maps in the infrared with uh, very well accuracy. But yes, you know, we can't uh, resolve structures smaller than, let's say, 0 0.05 parsecs. Now, Herschel I lets you... I can try and convert that into light years. That's all right. I, I, I can do that. That's fine. Herschel lets you see in the infrared, so you get to pee through all the gas and dust and, and see what's happening inside. What we see, basically, even in the infrared, is integrated properties of the cloud. That means that we see everything projected on the plane of the sky, so we don't see... We are not able to, to probe stuff throughout the cloud, unless uh, we have um, uh, spectroscopic observations. And again, even in that, that instance, there are a lot of complications. Well, actually, what we do, we, we, we can't observe, um, we, we can only observe the molecules that form inside the inside molecular clouds, right? And we can take spectrums and we can infer the, the velocity of the cloud, but this is the, the velocity only along our line of sight. So in the, um, in the directions perpendicular to our line of sight, we can't probe the directions actually. So we have again no way of knowing um, the 3D properties of the cloud precisely. So that gives uh, you only a limited view of what's actually going on. Right, right. Yes. The fact that the cloud is vibrating, or as you say, singing, how unique is that? We assume they do that, but that's never actually been observed before. Right. Yes, it hasn't been observed before. Um, well, actually, in order for us to, to infer that it sings, we use this, uh, this, uh, some structures uh, that are called striations, and they basically look like hair, right? And these structures have been observed uh, in many other clouds, but we don't know for sure yet. You know, we we will assess if um, other clouds behave like Mosca, but we don't know for sure yet if um, striations in other clouds are trapped waves or if they are simply waves or you know all these sorts of stuff. It's all because of the magnetic field. It's magnetic field, uh, magnetic uh, magnetic waves always that cause uh, the formation of striations. And that's the structures we use to also infer the, the vibrations of the more dense structures. How do you monitor the, the actual magnetic fields in the clouds itself? Is that simply by looking uh, at the dust or, or by looking at the how it's charged? Or? Through, through polarimetric observations, yes. With that. And tell me about the song of Muska. It's basically one frequency, um, uh, all, all of the frequencies that we've measured, right, in the observations, scale to the range of human hearing and turned into a song. And all of these frequencies are uh, superimposed one above the other, and that's how we got the song.
That's Dr. Aris Tritsis from the Australian National University. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered a quasar located almost 13 billion light years away, generating the brightest radio emissions ever observed in the early universe. The discovery, reported in the Astrophysical Journal, shines new light on the universe's first billion years of existence and consequently on early galaxy formation. The findings will allow astronomers to better probe the universe's youth during an important period of transition to its current state. The study's lead author, Eduardo Bernardos from the Carnegie Institute, says the radio beam indicates the active galactic nuclei is spewing out a massive jet of extremely fast-moving material. Quasars are powerful jets of matter and energy being emitted by supermassive black holes at the centres of galaxies as they feed on infalling material. While much of the accreting matter will pass beyond the black hole's event horizon and disappear forever, some will escape this fate, instead being channelled along powerful magnetic field lines and beamed into space, perpendicular to the black hole's accretion disk. These jets, travelling at close to the speed of light, are bright enough to be seen some 13 billion light years away, making them some of the most distant objects ever observed. The newly discovered quasar, called PSO J352.4034-15.3371, is extremely bright in frequencies detected by radio telescopes. Although quasars were identified more than 50 years ago by their strong radio emissions, we now know that only about 10% of them are strong in radio frequencies. Bernardo says there are a few known strong radio emitters in the early universe, and this is the brightest radio quasar in that ancient epoch by an order of magnitude. It's also the most detailed image yet of such a bright galaxy at this great distance. The Big Bang started the universe as a hot soup of extremely energetic particles 13.82 billion years ago. It's been rapidly expanding ever since. As it expanded, the cosmos cooled and coalesced into neutral hydrogen gas. But that still left the universe dark and without any luminous sources. That was at least until gravity condensed matter into the first stars and galaxies. Somewhere around 7 to 800 million years after the Big Bang, the energy released by those first stars and galaxies caused the neutral hydrogen that was scattered through the universe to get excited and lose an electron, in other words, to ionize, a state which the gas has remained in ever since. It's highly unusual to find a radio jet emitting quasar such as this one from the period just after the universe's lights came back on. Therefore, the jet from this quasar could serve as an important calibration tool, helping scientists penetrate the cosmic dark ages and perhaps reveal how the earliest galaxies came into being. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. The world's largest atom smasher, the Large Hadron Collider, or LHC, at CERN, the European Organisation for Nuclear Research, has begun accelerating heavy lead ions for the first time. A report in the journal Symmetry magazine says the Large Hadron Collider, which normally smashes protons together at some 99.9999% the speed of light, has now accelerated heavy lead atoms containing a single electron. The run was a proof-of-principle test for a new project called the Gamma Factory, which is part of CERN's Beyond Colliders project. LHC engineer Michaela Schaumann describes it as part of a program designed to investigate new ideas to broaden research and infrastructure, and finding out what's possible is the first step. During normal operations, the LHC produces a steady stream of proton-proton collisions. Then for about four weeks just before the annual winter shutdown, scientists begin smashing together atomic nuclei. But for a handful of days every year, during periods of machine development, accelerator physicists get to try something completely new. Previously, scientists accelerated xenon nuclei in the LHC and tested other kinds of partially stripped lead ions in the superproton synchrotron, the second largest machine at the accelerator complex. Accelerating a lead nuclei with just one remaining electron can be really challenging because of how delicate these atoms are. Schaumann says it's easy to accidentally strip off the electron, causing the nucleus to slam into the wall of the beam pipe because the charge is no longer synchronised with the LHC's magnetic field. During the first run, operators injected 24 packets of lead atoms and achieved a low-energy stable beam inside the LHC for about an hour. 
They then ramped up the LHC to its full power and maintained the beam for about two minutes before it was ejected into the beam dump. See, if too many particles go off course, the LHC will automatically dump the beam in order to protect the 27 km long underground collider and its magnets. After running the magnets through the restart cycle, Shalman and colleagues tried again, this time with only six packets. And they were able to keep the beam circulating for more than two hours before intentionally dumping it. Physicists expected the beam to last for about 15 hours, but were surprised to learn that the lifetime is really closer to 40 hours. You see, the idea is scientists would like to shoot the circulating atoms with a laser, causing the electron in those atoms to jump to higher energy levels. As the electron falls back down, it will then split out a particle of light, a photon. Now, in normal circumstances, this particle of light wouldn't be very energetic. But because the atom is already moving at close to the speed of light, the energy of the emitted photon would be boosted and its wavelength squeezed. And these gamma ray photons would then have sufficient energy to produce normal matter particles, such as quarks, electrons, and even muons. So you've got to remember here, matter and energy are two sides of the same coin. So these high energy gamma rays would be transforming into massive particles of matter. In fact, they could even morph into new kinds of matter, such as the mysterious, yet to be fully explained, dark matter. They could also be a source for new types of particle beams, such as a muon beam. And even though all of this is still a long way off, these tests now underway are an important first step in seeing what's possible. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Blue Origin's New Shepard Space Tourism Launch System has undertaken its ninth test flight, setting a new program altitude record of 118 kilometres. The suborbital mission launched from Blue Origin's Van Horn Test Facility in Texas. The flight began with a nominal 2 minute and 23 second burn of the launch booster's BE-3 main engine, enough to send the spacecraft on its ballistic trajectory to beyond the Kármán line, an altitude of 100 kilometres marking the official start of space. Main engine shutdown, or MECO, was followed by stage separation. And then, 20 seconds later, by the test firing of the capsule's escape motor in order to simulate a high altitude abort at the edge of space and near the apogee of the mission's flight profile. A previous flight test trialled the escape motor earlier in the mission's flight profile, during Max-Q, when the vehicle experiences maximum dynamic pressure during ascent. Seven minutes and 25 seconds after liftoff, the launch booster safely returned to the surface, touching down on its landing pad. It was followed four minutes later by the capsule, touching down nearby under three giant blue and orange parachutes with its soft landing motors igniting a split second before contact. This successful ninth test paves the way for the next flight to employ a fully fitted out version of the capsule, with the first manned flight possibly to be undertaken before the end of the year. The mission also carried eight scientific experiments, as well as Blue Origin's test flight dummy mannequin Skywalker, who was on his third journey to space. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. SpaceX has set a new record, launching the largest commercial satellite ever flown by a Falcon 9 rocket. Using the new Block 5 version of the Falcon 9 for only the second time, the 7,075-kilogram Telstar 19 Vantage satellite blasted off from Space Launch Complex 40 at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida under inky black early morning skies bound for geostationary orbit. One, zero, ignition, Lift off. And we've had successful liftoff of the Falcon 9 rocket. All nine of those first stage Merlin engines glowing beautifully, carrying Telstar 19 Vantage to geostationary transfer orbit. Now upon ascent, we go through max Q as our first milestone. And again, that's the maximum aerodynamic pressure. It's an important milestone because it means that from that moment on, we're going through thinner and thinner atmosphere and less and less stress vehicle has reached maximum aerodynamic pressure. And we've got that confirmation on the nets that we have gone through max Q. So again, less and less stress in the vehicle as we go up and up from here on out. Just two minutes and 40 seconds after launch, the Falcon 9's nine Merlin 1D engines reached Miko, or main engine cutoff. The shutdown was followed by stage separation and ignition of the Falcon 9 single upper stage Merlin MVAC vacuum engine. Miko. Stage separation confirmed. 
recognition. And you heard the callouts of main engine cutoff, stage separation, and then second engine start. The next milestone is fairing deploy. We're going to jettison those fairing halves because once we're out in space, we no longer need that aerodynamic shield. So in order to become more fuel efficient, we get rid of this unnecessary mass. Vehicle on nominal trajectory. Fairing separation confirmed. And we've successfully had fairing separation. As those halves gently float away, we now have Telstar attached to second stage, exposed to the vacuum of space, continuing on through its first burn. As the upper stage continued to power the telecommunications satellite into orbit on the first of its two engine burns, the first stage successfully returned to Earth, landing on the autonomous drone ship, of course I still love you, which had been pre-positioned 300 kilometers downrange in the North Atlantic Ocean. Now we had successful liftoff, first stage is heading back the sequence that we're going to perform regarding the burns for the first stage is a two burn sequence. It's going to be re-entry and landing. There's no boost back burn this time because we're simply going to follow a ballistic trajectory out into the Atlantic Ocean. Second stage is continuing on, doing its first of two bland burns, carrying Telstar to GTO. Stage one entry burn has started. And there you have it. This burn will last for about 20 seconds. And the purpose of this burn is to slow the vehicle down. Out in space, there aren't many particles. It's much sparser out there. But once we re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, the air actually creates quite a bit of drag on the vehicle. So we want to burn to slow ourselves down so that we don't experience a bunch of heat and stress accumulation on first stage. Second stage following nominal trajectory. Stage one entry burn is shut down. And the burn has concluded. To give some scope for what that burn did, we're currently traveling about a, looks like a 17,000 kilometers per hour. That is multiple times the speed of a commercial airliner. And in about a minute and a half, we're gonna be touching down on that drone ship. So in the course of about 90 seconds, we're gonna be going from many times the speed of a jet to zero. So it really shows the efficacy of those burns as they decelerate the vehicle. Now, as we continue this landing sequence of first stage, second stage is gonna continue its action as well. Second stage, second engine cutoff, so SECO number one, that will conclude right in the middle of the landing sequence. So the landing burn will begin about 10 seconds later up in space. Second stage will stop firing its engine. And then about five seconds after that, back on Earth, the first stage will finish its landing burn and hopefully touch stage down on the surface of, of course, I still love you. Starting terminal guide. Stage one, landing burn is starting. Stage two, AFTS has safe. Drone ship has AOS. Landing legs have deployed. Now, SECO should have occurred as well. So in the middle of that sequence of landing, as I said, second engine cutoff number one did happen. So the first of the two plan burns of second stage has concluded. Second stage is in good orbit. At this moment, we're going to enter about an 18 minute coast phase. Again, second stage has two plan burns, as I said, and the second one will start about 18 minutes from now. Built by Space Systems Laurel, the Telstar 19 Vantage satellite is equipped with high throughput KA and KU band transponders based around the SSL 13 satellite bus carrying enough fuel for a 15 year lifespan. The flight was the 57th launch for a Falcon 9 and the 13th mission for SpaceX this year. SpaceX's next launch will be the Iridium 7 mission aboard a Falcon 9, launching from the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, with 10 Iridium Next telecommunication satellites on board, slated for launch just three days after the Telstar 19 Vantage flight. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. A new study warns that the Earth is at risk of entering a hothouse climate event capable of causing average global temperatures to climb up to 5 degrees Celsius higher than pre-industrial levels, resulting in long-term rises in sea levels of between 10 and 60 metres. The findings, reported in the journal PNAS, show that climate change feedback loops triggered by human-caused global warming will start to kick in with global temperatures increasing by just 2 degrees Celsius, making things far worse than already predicted. Researchers warn that such increases in temperatures and sea level will be devastating for civilization and for most ecosystems that support plant and animal life. In fact, many parts of the planet will become uninhabitable for humans. Right now, average global temperatures are just over 1 degree Celsius above pre-industrial levels and are increasing by 0.17 degrees Celsius each decade. The new study, led by Professor Will Steffen from the Australian National University, examined 10 natural feedback loop processes, some of which will lead to abrupt changes once critical thresholds are crossed. These feedback loops include the thawing of permafrost, 
the loss of methane hydrates from the ocean floor, the weakening of land and ocean carbon sinks, increasing bacterial respiration in the oceans, Amazon rainforest dieback, boreal forest dieback, a reduction in northern hemisphere snow cover, the loss of Arctic summer sea ice, and a reduction in Antarctic sea ice and polar ice sheets. There's been a call for Australian blood pressure guidelines to lower the cutoff for what's considered high blood pressure in order to better match new American guidelines. A report in the Medical Journal of Australia claims the move would more than double the proportion of Australian adults currently labelled as having high blood pressure. Dropping blood pressure targets from the current 140 over 90 down to 130 over 80 would change the health status of some 4.5 million Australians. Good blood pressure is considered to be 120 over 80. Mathematician Akshay Venkatesh has become only the second Australian to win the Fields Medal, often described as the Nobel Prize for Mathematics. The medal is awarded every four years to between two and four researchers under 40 years of age in order to recognise their outstanding mathematical achievements for existing work and for the promise of future achievement. The medal is named after the Canadian mathematician John Charles Fields, who conceived the award to celebrate great achievements in the area of mathematics. In addition to a gold medal, the winner also receives $15,400. The largest study of its kind ever undertaken has failed to find any association between brain tumours and high-frequency electromagnetic fields in the workplace. High-frequency electromagnetic fields are a form of non-ionising radiation. They comprise intermediate frequencies of 3 kHz to 10 MHz and radio frequencies of 10 MHz to 300 GHz. The findings, reported in the journal Environment International, looked at some 4,000 brain tumour cases as well as 5,600 controls. Occupational sectors involved in exposure to electromagnetic fields include working with or near radars, telecommunications antennas, medical diagnosis and treatment and microwave drying ovens. Researchers, however, aren't satisfied with their results and urged for further studies to be carried out. A new study has shown that dogs are capable of understanding the emotions behind an expression on a human face. The findings reported in the journal Learning and Behaviour is the latest study to reveal just how connected dogs are with people. By living in close contact with humans, dogs have developed specific skills that allow them to interact and communicate efficiently with people. The test involved watching what happens when they presented photographs of the same two adult faces to 26 dogs as they were feeding. The images were placed strategically to the sides of the animal's line of sight, and the photos showed a human face expressing one of the six basic human emotions, anger, fear, happiness, sadness, surprise, disgust, or simply being neutral. The dog showed greater response and cardiac activity when shown photographs expressing an arousing emotional state, such as anger, fear, or happiness. They also took longer to resume eating after seeing these images. The dog's increased heart rates also indicate that in these cases, the animals experienced higher levels of stress. In addition, the dogs also tended to turn their heads to the left when they saw human faces expressing anger, fear or happiness. And the reverse happened when the faces expressed surprise, possibly because the dogs viewed it as a non-threatening, relaxed expression. The findings support the existence of an asymmetrical emotional modulation of dogs' brains to process basic human emotions. You're listening to Space Time, I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 